common practice in the shipping industry. But just because something's a common practice doesn't necessarily make it right. More research was needed. And this research concentrated on three areas where the stakeholders believed that existing regulations could effectively prevent seafarer fatigue, what were the barriers to implementation on board ships, and how closely actual practice complied with current regulations. Well, the resulting World Maritime University report was released last year at a time when the COVID-19 pandemic had focused our attention on how hard it was becoming to get seafarers home at the end of their contracts and how hard it was proving to get seafarers from their homes to their ships. This humanitarian crisis attracted worldwide media attention and even went up to the General Assembly of the United Nations. But this had the effect of diverting attention from a pre-existing crisis. Now, this crisis has been hushed up for years, even decades. I won't preempt my panelists by giving you the main findings, except to say that the analysis made indicates that, quote, insufficient levels of manning are root cause of violations and recording malpractices, unquote. At peak workload conditions, seafarers are exhausted and they seem pretty stressed at other times too. Now this webinar brings together industry experts um, to talk about exhaustion, which is defined in my dictionary as a state of extreme physical and mental tiredness. Exhaustion has implications that spread far and wide, including safety of fellow seafarers, the ship they are on, and the other shipping nearby. My name is Richard Clayton. I am the Chief Correspondent at Lloyd's List, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon's event. Alongside me virtually, I'm joined by Dr. Cleopatra Dumbia Henry, President of the World Maritime University. Professor Raphael Baumler, Head of Maritime Safety and Environmental Administration at the World Maritime University. Julie Carlton, Head of Seafarer Safety and Health, UK Seafarer Services at the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Mark Dickinson, General Secretary of Nautilus International. Katie Higginbottom, Chief Executive of the ITF Seafarers Trust, which sponsored this research. Well, no doubt this isn't the first webinar you've attended since the coronavirus pandemic started. If it's anything like me, it's probably the 101st. But this one will be different. Unlike other webinars in which issues will be repeated again and again and again, the shipping industry needs to tackle exhaustion and needs to do so quickly. So there will be a call to action at the end with a view to making sure this discussion is taken further. And to help us in that endeavor, you'll see a chat box on your screens, which I invite you to use to send uh, questions, comments, suggestions. The more you use this chat box, the better we'll get a feeling of uh, your opinion. I might not have time to respond to all of your questions, but um, what I tend to do is to push the questions around to all of the panelists and hopefully we'll bring you the answers you're looking for. First, I'd like to invite Katie Higginbottom to say a few words about the research on which this report was based. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with such an illustrious panel. Um, we were really pleased to sponsor this research with World Maritime University. Obviously, as you've said, the issue of fatigue and hours of work and hours of rest has been already well documented. But despite the research that clearly shows the adverse impact on physical and mental health of seafarers, and consequently the operation of a ship, there has been really no traction when it comes to making changes to current practices. So this research proposal really caught our attention because it comes to the issue from a completely different angle. 
So we thought maybe there's a chance to catch the attention um, and have more traction here by highlighting the really shocking finding that all of the elements in the system to monitor and manage seafarers' hours of work and hours of rest are in fact gaming the system. Um, and it's not necessarily a conscious decision, it's more of an acceptance that this is how things are and a kind of willingness to support commercial interests at the expense of safeguarding long-term well-being. So we're obviously interested in that because the ITF Seafarers Trust is all about seafarers welfare and well-being. Um, but apart from that, the other important aspect of this research project is the stakeholder engagement. So we, we really wanted to support um, a living research project that doesn't stop with the academic findings, but actually leads to more constructive cooperation. So um, it was really great to work with Raphael and his students, especially um, Yvette and Bikram. Um, and it's it was really reassuring to work with academic people who've got the practical maritime experience to bring to bear on the issue. So I don't want to take up any more time than that. Um, let me pass the floor back to you to get into the discussion. Thank you. So I'd just like to pick up on one word that you, you use there, Katie, the word acceptance, um, as if seafarers have tried and failed to get anything changed but they just have to accept and they move on that's who seafarers are aren't they resilient you don't complain yeah. just get on with it exactly i think um, and of course this research was done before the pandemic so it was serious then um now things are exponentially worse and underlying it all is the fact that people are worried about their job prospects so to go slightly um, away from uh, the expectations of ship owners um, in terms of what might happen if they if they flag up a problem, the risk of not being reemployed um, is, is is the kind of fundamental problem underpinning it all. I think. Indeed. So um, thank you for um, sponsoring the research. I'd like to go to um, uh, Dr. Cleopatra Dumbia Henry, if I if I can see her, please, Paul. Um, hi, Cleo. Um, can you just give us the context in which uh, this report um, was was made? How bad is the situation now? Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me in this important webinar. Uh, and certainly hours of work and hours of rest are uh, some of the critical issues that not only must be addressed, but must be now addressed without delay. I mean, the pandemic has shown, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the stress and strains that seafarers have been under, the fact that they've been not been able to, uh, you know, leave to, to return home. And we still have, we still, we still have the majority of seafarers uh, who've been at sea for all of those months, they're still at sea and not been able to yet return home. So the situation in my view is even more grave than it has ever, it, we ever imagined it could be. Um, and, and so uh, this report in my view, you know, unfortunately it came uh, you know, we issued, it was issued before that whole pandemic problem started. Um, uh, but if if we had had a little bit more time, we would have actually, you know, this would have, you know, the impact would have even that we would have been able to identify would have been even greater. But as, uh, <clears throat> without that, it is very clear that um, the hours of work and hours of rest are one of the big issues that have never really been appropriately addressed. While they are they exist in terms of what the important standards are that must be respected in terms of the numbers of hours of work and the hours of rest. We know very, very well that the culture, you know, the culture of adjustment has been with the industry for a very, very long time. And that even with the instruments being adopted, the IMO in terms of the provisions that it has on hours 
of rest and the ILO provisions and hours of work already the just the fact that the two are not integrated into the one in in itself is is a challenge uh, but because you know one it can be monitored on one side in one way but not on the other side you know IMO side which is the hours of rest while the ILO committee of experts can monitor uh, better what countries compliance in terms at least of the legislation that they have the legislation in place because one of the fundamentals is that uh, many countries still have not ratified the MLC and all the earlier conventions and hours of work uh, and hours of work that the ILO had adopted in the past. So we still do have uh, registries that have not implemented in their legislations, and that's one of the things I wanted that we often forget. So one thing is to have the instrument. The other thing is to ensure that the legislation itself um, integrates these 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 changes and the require new requirements. Integrate the MLC, integrate the uh, the provisions relating to IMOs, hours, STCW hours, uh, um, and 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 so we do know we have this little tension between these two. Uh, and the, what is good is that the the MLC does integrate both components. It does talk about the hours of rest and the hours of work, having had IMOs. But again, at the same time, one can choose hours of work or the other hours of rest. So I do think that um, with the pandemic, it has only made it worse. Uh, and so my my that report, in my view, was timely. It's timely. It's a report that we can that can be used and should be used to really create greater awareness within the industry, especially taking into account today COVID nineteen and its impact on seafarers. How that culture of adjustment must end. Now, one of the challenges of yeah, sorry, that sorry, I, I, end. Can I, can I interrupt you very, very uh, before we go too deeply? Um, can you just explain very very simply the relationship between the World Maritime University and the IMO so we get that settled right at the beginning? Okay. Well, the World Maritime University is an IMO institution. It's an IMO academic institution that was established 30, no, seven years ago, 37 years ago, with a view to educating and training and building the capacity for all developing countries to enable them to more effectively engage in maritime in maritime affairs. Mm -hmm. And so that university is a postgraduate university offering, offering uh, degrees at the master's level and the doctoral level, as well as capacity building programs and distance learning programs that complement that package of academic programs being offered. This is a unique um, academic institution, the unique one in the world, because it is dedicated um, to building the capacity that was its initial objective of particularly for, for um, country, developing countries to help them to build senior level expertise um, to operate um, in, in, in the maritime and ocean and oceans world. So this was the objective and it has to date had more than 5,300 uh, uh, graduates from the university who have gone back into senior management positions and been able to have an impact in their countries. We will, of course, it's a, it's as part of IMO, uh, it enables us as well to reach out immediately to all governments of IMO to ensure that they themselves send their, um, their senior level staff to have that level of academic knowledge and expertise that will enable those countries then to operate in the maritime field. In the okay. entire maritime field. Very good. Thank you very much. You, you are in a unique position. So, so I'd like to bring in um, Professor Raphael Baumler. Um, can we get him up on the screen, please? Good afternoon, Raphael. Nice to see you. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you. Can you just give us the, the headline findings from this report as, as you see them, please? Okay, uh, just before starting, if you don't mind, I would like very much to thank also the colleagues that work with me with the reports. I mean, Yvette de Clerc, Professor Laura Carabayo, Professor Michael Manuel, Bikram, and I would like also to thank very much the participants. What is important in every research is to have a lot of participants, what happened. So the highlight is very much, I, I would like to start first with the starting point. What, what we started is with a simple observation. Despite the entry into force of ILO and IMO requirements, 
the issue of fatigue, as previously stated, has continuously been reported in research. And, and we wanted to have uh, an idea of what's happening here. What is the problem, really? So supported by the ITF CFRS Trust, we started to research the CFRS recording practices and the implementation itself of the work and rest hours. So for that, as was said previously, we, we started to investigate the CFRS, but also the other maritime stakeholders, such as shipping companies, professional trade organizations, etc., and also the post control to see the implementation of it. So very rapidly, and especially with the CFRS, basically we had concurring evidences which confirm the previous reports, and it was extremely clear. The CFRS highlighted that the adjustment of records is not something anecdotal, but it's very common. It seems also during the research and what happened, it seems that it's a genuine culture of adjustment, which is established now among CFRS. It is very worrying because we also noticed that this culture of adjustment is transmitting from older generation to new generation. Senior officer transmitting these ideas to junior officer, to cadets, and it makes it very complicated, in fact, to stop it. And, and we really need to tackle this issue. The research also highlighted that there is some very unexpected types of recording practices. One person appointed to do the work for everybody without even looking at it. The only purpose was to make sure that it's in compliance with what is expected, not with the reality. The use of software uh, and the software are used in a way to detect where are the violations in order to correct them instead of only recording in the software. We, we have also noticed that the CFRs uh, do not really want to, to report to their, uh, to their shore management because when they report, they are afraid. Uh, and sometimes they are either ignored, the report is just ignored, the feedback is not even taken into consideration, or eventually they are blamed for reporting it. So it's very complicated. It looks very much that the fear, or at least the perception of fear, is really the main drivers for adjustment of records for CFRs. But there is also some other drivers which have been highlighted. It's like key performance indicators, bonuses, which also create an incentive basically for wrong reportings. So also what we noticed, it's uh, the, the wrong reporting or malpractice in record keeping was not limited to rest hours. It was also affecting some other records. Uh, what we've been astonished very much is to see also uh, the other maritime stakeholders. And here we just noticed that all the maritime stakeholders basically know the problem. They are aware of the problem. And it was really surprising to see that. We said that everybody is aware, but nothing is really doing anything. And we were very surprised by that. We were not expecting it very much. On the third, um, I would say, group of persons that we investigated, which were the post state control officers, what was very interesting, we, we investigate post state control officers from around the world. And what was very interesting is they provide always the same views and they show exactly the same practice around the world, which shows that basically the procedures provided by the IMO and the ILO are quite well implemented in this respect. However, what they were highlighting, they were highlighting that they understand that fatigue is very important among CFRs, they understand it, but they rarely go beyond what is supposed for, to do in an initial inspection, which is looking at the papers, if they are on board, that's fair enough. So it means, in short, for the post state control officers, most of them, if the paperwork is in order, there is no further investigation. Uh, knowing this, in fact, it's, it's the idea also is interesting. Knowing this, the CFRs basically prepare the record accordingly. So they prepare the record in a way that there will be no deficiency for the ship, because what they are afraid of, if there is a deficiency, they will be blamed for it. So. From, from the side of the post control officers, when we were asking them what, what, what's happening, you don't know that there is this. They said, yes, we, we know that there is a record keeping which are not always in order. We know that, but we don't have sufficient time to do everything. And we have to prioritize. We have a very long checklist of items to do in a very short time period, and we have to deal with it. Therefore, it looks like the verification of the accuracy of the records in general, is not a priority for them. It's time consuming. It's difficult to find clear ground. You really have to investigate, cross-check information. And it's difficult to take what will be the next action if you find something was also an issue raised by many post control officers. 
And in fact, for them, it was very low return on investment. A lot of work for finally not being having very substantial evidence. So it was complicated for them also. So in conclusion, I would say that we, we've noticed very much a normalization of deviance, which seems tacitly accepted by the maritime community. And this is also a worrying element. Uh, for us, we identify this as a systemic failure, meaning that from the ship crew to the regulators, to the companies, basically everybody is closing its eye to this problem. And we see it as a major failure. Finally, I would say in terms of takeaways globally, most of the, of the participants also very clearly highlighted, as you said before, several failures in the implementation of uh, mining resolutions, which is leading to inadequacy in terms of crew size versus the operational demands. There have been also some uh, clear remarks by the stakeholders about the problem to align now the regulations with evidence-based research on fatigue. And there, it looks like there is a clear mismatch between what is fatigue research saying and what are the regulations in place in the maritime. There is also a very important element that I would very much like to stress is the problem of the feedback mechanism. Uh, when we had, after the arrival of free enterprise and the other major accident, when we had the ISM code, basically one of the core elements of the ISM code was to facilitate the communication between the ships and the top management of the companies through the DPA. And it looks like this feedback mechanism is not working as it should be. And it's probably something also very much to consider. And finally, uh, because we've been quite exhaustive in what we were doing and, and we've, we've worked because it's one of the essence of WMU to work with administrations. What we realize also that surveyors and posted control uh, officers in general, they really have a huge work to do and accuracy of records is not very much a priority. They want to complete their checklist. And here I think we, we should also consider the inappropriacy, sorry, of the enforcement of regulation in terms of hours of work and hours of rest. That's basically my conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of lot, lot of meat in there, and we'll come back to uh, some of those points in, in in a little while. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baumler. Um, Julie Carlton from the Maritime Coast Guard Agency. Can you hear me, Julie? Hello okay. there. Good, good, good. To, well, welcome to to this webinar. Um, when you, as a um, as the MCA, read this report, what were your thoughts? Well, first of all, we very much welcome it. Um, we do feel that um, there's a need for more and more evidence to be built uh, to get this this scientific evidence mm -hmm. to be built to, to take this issue to an international level. You know, the report points out that it's an international you know, the, the the regulation is international level we need we need to take evidence to the international fora that there is a problem um, and that this report helps to build that evidence base was there not enough evidence before do you think well i think there's um there is plenty of evidence from previous reports that the current hours of work regimes can lead to fatigue um i think this is a this, as somebody else has said this this tackled it from a different end um it's looking at it from you know why why is the system not working properly you know we have the rules mm -hmm. um so i think you know and and it and it comes up with with recommendations about enforcement but also recommendations about looking again at the standards um you know so it, it covers a wide a, a range of, of of um ways of addressing the issue and when you think about the uk uh seafarers are they in the same position as perhaps seafarers from a different part of the world uh, do we tend to speak out more than um i don't know filipinos or indians or chinese as as seafarers um yes. well we do get complaints and we do in investigate those um so that's a good sign that's a sign that seafarers um, are aware of their their rights and that the rules that should be being applied and, and are confident to, to address those um, you know they come to us when when they've exhausted the, the sort of the means within the company very often um, 
and uh, we're able to step in and, and investigate those complaints. Which kind of underlines the systemic failures that we're talking about here. If, if you've gone as far as you should and you get nowhere, then you've got to try the, the MCA and other bodies. Yes, yes. But, the, but there are systems there within the regulatory regime that allow that to happen as well, which is... Um, okay. Helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to you in a second, if I may. I want to bring in uh, Mark Dickinson. Hi, Richard. Hello, Mark. Hi, uh, how are you, sir? Good, good, mate. Um, give me the trade union perspective on this. Um, as, as, I was, as I was saying earlier, um, we've, got, we've got enough evidence to stop this happening. Why is it continuing? Why is it continuing? Oh. I guess if I knew the answer to that, it, uh, suc that I, and I could put it succinctly, I probably wouldn't be sitting here, I'd probably be running the IMO or running the ILO or something. But I think uh, I, I, I can give you the... I give you a take on this from the union's point of view that, that this evidence is, I think, as Julie said, is approaching this from from a different uh, from a different direction than the, perhaps some of the more, the more uh, esoteric academic studies of, of, of the past. In fact, the most recent one that springs to my mind is Project Horizon, which was about how we manage uh, fatigue, which um, as useful and as interesting as the findings of that EU-sponsored research that we took part in, actually. Um, uh, was it, it, it started from the basis of how we managed it, so how we can carry on as we are whilst recognising that, that the manning levels and the hours of work cause fatigue and stress amongst the seafaring population. But this, this report is, is, is different. I was asked by some seafarers on a previous webinar, uh, you know, was I really shocked? Uh, and I said, well, no, I'm not shocked, but it is shocking. When you read this report, it really does get you between between the eyes and I'm absolutely determined, which is why we've put this webinar on with our colleagues from WMU and the Seafarers Trust and with the help of Julie and others, um, you know, that this doesn't gather dust on a shelf with some of the other reports that, are, that have been talked about. Mm -hmm. um, we, this has to represent, especially on the back of the past 12 months and the experience of Seafarers in COVID-19, it has to represent a line in the sand and says, we need to do something about this problem. We cannot, ignore, continue to ignore. There'll be colleagues on this call, there'll be seafarers on this webinar and they're, they're putting their comments there in the chat box who will be cynical and skeptical about whether anything is ever going to change. And part of the problem is, and I think you hinted at this a minute ago, Richard, and, and others did, that seafarers almost accept that this is the norm, that, that their job is to get the job done, do the hours that are necessary, don't complain, uh, don't make any grievances don't you know don't raise any complaints through formal or informal pro processes and just get the job because that's what we've always uh, been expected to do and that can't continue and i'll tell you one good reason why it can't continue apart from the very obvious personal health issues and safety of shipping it can't it can't continue because one of the consequences of covid19 is thousands and thousands of seafarers considering again why they made this career that a cho choice to pursue this career, the way they've been treated. We as an industry, unions, ship owners, governments, port flag states, labor supply states, we are going to have to reinvent and recreate a desire for people to engage in this crucial, critical key industry that keeps global supply chains moving. And having humane working conditions, hours of work that don't make you ill, uh, don't put your health in danger, or don't put the safety of you and your ship, your colleagues, and the marine environment, let's not forget, at risk, is yeah. going to be fundamental to that. We cannot continue to allow people to work 91 or 90, what, 98 hours a week. And this report uh, shines a shocking light on those practices that have just become acceptable and normal. Uh, one of the problems we've had during uh, COVID is, is obviously getting uh, seafarers back home and it's been a real strain for everybody. Has this underlined a problem that was already there that nobody really thinks of seafarers as being key workers? 
Y yes, um, but I'd rather see that in the context of uh, of uh, if there is a silver, if you can imagine a silver lining in a global pandemic. The conversations now where that we as unions, as you know, in our federations, ITF, uh, international level and European level, ETF, are now having with organisations that are actively engaged in the pan in in response to this humanitarian crisis that Katie referred to is incredible. This is an opportunity to continue that conversation. You know, the Neptune Declaration. It it's tempting to be to dismiss it as just a you know well-meaning words, but. The organisations that have signed up to that, there's some there's some really important key new engaged actors and stakeholders in this discussion that we have got to continue to talk to. UN General Assembly resolutions, ILO governing body resolutions, committee of experts that Cleo mentioned to area engaging in this issue. So we have, we've got to use that as a springboard to affect real change for seafarers. Let's not waste this opportunity. We're really determined that that doesn't happen. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, Katie Heenbottom again, if uh, if you would. Katie, if we can have you up on the screen, please. Certainly a different way of uh, running a webinar. Hello, Katie. Good to see you again. <laughs> um, listen, Katie, we've talked about acceptance, the, uh, you know, uh, among seafarers that this is a problem that's that's always been there. Um, how do we break that circle? How do we stop seafarers thinking this is the way it's always going to be? I think you're on mute, Katie. You're quite right. There we go. Um, I, I think we cannot put the onus back on seafarers to deal with this themselves. I think, yes, of course, everyone has a, a role in equipping people with the knowledge to understand their rights and what they should be saying. But the reality is um, they don't have the power to make those kind of um, judgments. We have to um, get together all of the people that are involved in the... Um, the, the enforcement of regulation and the, the review of regulation to make sure that it is possible to avoid um, what Raphael eloquently calls the um, the normalization of deviance. You know, that's a kind of interesting um, phrase, I think. Um, and the problem that we've always had is that there hasn't been the political will to deal with the, with the evidence that's there. There hasn't been the will of the of the people in the IMO to actually accept how to address um, proper ways of determining operational safe manning. That will hasn't been there, and we haven't been able to break it. So the question is: Can we come at it from another way, and can we make it impossible for people really to ignore this situation? And but we, I don't think there's any point in doing it in a really confrontational way. I think it's more a question of. Um, providing tools and, and bringing people together so that we can break down this dysfunctional culture. So it's not up to the seafarers to actually challenge the system. The system, uh, th th those who manage the system, really need to, to, to understand how bad this, this has got. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Raphael um, Baumler, can I just come back to you very quickly, please? Um, we, we talk uh, about the, the enforcement of regulation. Is this the point at which this is going wrong, that, that the regulations are in place, but they're not being enforced correctly? It's one of the aspects. I would say it's only one of them. I mean, it's, it's complicated for, for that to explain, but what, what is the implementation of a regulation? Basically, the first layer of implementation should be on the vessel. Make sure that on the ship it's implemented. After, it's up also to the company to do it. And of course, what is very important, it's for the flag state uh, inspectors and the port state inspectors to verify that the implementation supposedly done by the company on board the ships, the verification layer by the company is done. But, and what we noticed basically, it's nobody really wants to look at it. It looks also that the, um, the guidance today 
related to how out of work and hours of rest are limited in terms of it's what i was saying just previously it's, it's the boss and control officer are just looking at the records they are not supposed to go beyond this first uh checks and only if there is some clear ground that they can go beyond but you cannot find clear ground if it's not obvious if the record is perfect by itself so they have to find clear ground somewhere else or to have been reported by some some personnel some crew members reporting or claiming that there is a problem here. So the enforcement is definitely an issue. I think that the enforcement problem, it's not only the capacity, I would say the capacity of post control uh, officer is not very much into question. It's very much, do they have time to do it? Do they really want to invest time? I mean, they are human beings like any workers. They are human beings. So they, they have a limitation of what they can do. And it's always easy to blame people and the other people, but I think we have also very much to understand the limitation of the job. They have limited time to do a lot of things and they will prioritize, they will prioritize because for them also having a return on investment if they investigate, it's taking time and it's, it's not a very easy ground. It's quite a slippery ground. Find exactly cross check, not being sure because if people are not speaking up, they, they have a problem how to demonstrate it and providing evidence. Also, what we noticed is the some some posted control officer clearly highlighted they don't want to be in trouble either. They don't want to make a mistake and say we stopped the vessel for six hours or more or whatever the enforcement action taken for a problem like that. And after being blamed by the archi because the shipping company started to and say that this is undue delay. So they are also this kind of a hammer on the head and which are they are a little bit afraid of. So how do we how do we solve that if the port state control officer doesn't have the time to check these records how do we take it what to the next level I, I would not say exactly they don't have time it, the problem in today's checklist by port state control officer it's it's a full checklist and they have to check item by item but probably we can think in a different way the port state control as it is and thinking maybe there are some elements that can demonstrate a problem of compliance in general. If we have a vessel which is systematically violating hours of work and hours of rest, basically it's an evidence that there is a major issue inside on, on this ship and probably in the relationship between the ship and the company. I, I would like to stress very much here the idea of the six on six off. Uh, six on six off which has been clearly reported uh, by by the different participants is a major issue cfar is working on that clearly highlighted respecting rest hours is nearly impossible i remember there were also a paper uh, made by the government of france to the imo a few years back highlighting also that it was not possible it was an in paper on the research they made so here we are, we are very we, we have a problem we have six on six off but there is no a uh, specific action taken by the post control officers on this type of vessel because if you have nice records on on ships which are operating six on top there is a problem this is nearly certain so how to address this issue it's probably by for the post control officer and and the, and the mous basically to consider that there is some elements of regulation that probably are revealing more things than some other ones Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I turn again to Julie Carlton, please? So, Julie, you've you've heard a little bit about the uh, the port state control um, angle here. Um, what can we do as port state port state control officers to not obviously tackle the issue, but uh, prioritize? Uh, seafarer <laughs> timing. Work yes, I mean, it's, and I, I, as Rafa has already said, that the, the port state control officer is there to enforce five or six conventions, and this is this is one of them. Yeah. Um, there have been concentrated inspection campaigns um, on the issue of fatigue. Um, the, the, perhaps there's scope for more of, of that, and that that mechanism of concentrated inspection campaigns is a a possibility because that then allocates more time specifically to that to this issue um and i guess also being available to the seafarers to give them the opportunity to point out problems as much as possible i know that's that's not always um ideal either um 
I mean, the other, the other point that's been made about Port Strait Control Inspectors, of course, is it's taking up the time of the seafarers, which is adding to their hours of work, which, you know, so it's, it is a very difficult balance, I think, for, for them to strike. And I'm not, I, I think Port Strait Control shouldn't be the, um, the only solution though, should it? You know, the Port Strait Control is only, is only there to back up the rules that are already there and I don't, should be being enforced by the flag states. And I think that's, you know, I think that has to be borne in mind as well. We can't, re you know, can't rely entirely on port states. We're not relying entirely, but we perhaps it's it's one of those steps that we yes. need to put in place yeah. to be able to say, hey, I, I understand there's an issue here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Nobody's blaming port state. Nobody's blaming seafarers. We, we've got to try and find a way mm -hmm. to work out of this. Um, yeah. OK. Um, can I go back to Mark Dickinson, please? Hi, Richard. Mark, Mark, we've talked about six hours on, six hours off um, for years. Um, we're no further forward solving that. And surely that culture is what's making us exhausted. Yeah, six on six off is a particular uh, challenge and long been recognised. And uh, if there's if there's research on fatigue, a lot of it will will also address the the, the six on six off um, uh, pers perspective. And of course, the the, the MLC um, makes special provision for those types of watch arrangements by providing for derogations from the hours of work and rest regimes that are specified in the MLC in in return for. Uh, shorter periods, uh, shorter tours of duty, longer leave patterns, and I think that that's an area where flag states should should be looking at the uh, six on six off arrangements. Um, longer term, I think six on six off. Uh, I think uh, one of my colleagues has already commented in the chat there about uh, uh, Project Horizon that I referenced earlier, and, it, and that report was. Um, uh, very critical of six on six off arrangements, um, and they do they do build the, the fatigue that builds up over the over the period of that intense activity that six on six off represents um, needs to be compensated by by longer rest. So because you know the the longer you work those intense patterns, uh, the, the the you build up uh, fatigue. Um, it, you know it's a cumulative process, whereas you know, when, in my days working deep sea, we would have intense periods where we would let, work long, long hours in port, and we might have successive ports. But then we would have long sea voyages in which you could sort of fall back into a more regular, balanced pattern of work, which allowed you to 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 recover. And that doesn't happen in six on six off trade. So that that is that there is a there is a particular problem there. There is a particular flag states that have. Uh, um, interest in the six on six off, um, and you know they resisted change over over, over the years, um, and that's got to be that's got to be tackled. We've, we've got to do something about that. Can I'd like to make the point, if I may, Richie, while you've given me the floor, just to build in another perspective, because I think um, there's a lot of talk about technology, about uh, automation, about reducing manning levels even further, and I just might make a plea. Uh, that we actually think about how technology can help enhance the working experience of existing seafarers before we contemplate removing even more from the equation. 91, 98 hours a week, uh, and people want to replace them with technology, um, technological advancements. I think that technology should address those hours of work before we, before we, you know, even ca countenance further reductions. So there's a question I'll chat here. Um, should port state control data, which includes MLC defects, be shared with insurers? So is this a safety issue? Well, it is, a, it is fundamentally a safety issue. And it's actually, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's, there is a, there is a lot of publicly available uh, data Um and and I think insurers and PI clubs do do pay attention, but I, I I you know so far we haven't been able to resolve this this issue of fatigue and long hours of work. Safe manning is obviously crucial to that, as as Raphael WMU report is has highlighted. So 
we've got to have a more realistic assessment of what is required on board yeah. ships to carry out all the functions that need to be carried out. Insurers and P&I clubs, they can help. They can fundamentally, they can make a difference in this discussion uh, and they should. So it's the conversation is a holistic one, isn't it? Everybody must see this as something that that reflects upon them. So the the question that I'm going to ask all of my panelists, um, and Mark, you don't get any time to to prepare on this one, but what does a good work rest hours culture look like? Well, it it, it has to start from a, a, a realistic assessment of 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 the resources needed to run a ship safely um so that's the that's the first thing so you start with the the imo principles set of safe manning and and actually have a a, a a proper a realistic assessment of what's required uh, obviously um flag states need to work together in that in that respect because there's no point the, there's no point duly uh, for uk saying right well we're going to increase manning levels because we're going to have a realistic assessment of safe manning um, and then someone else decide to undercut them uh, to in order to uh, grow the register. So that's the first thing, the practical yeah. uh, issue that's necessary. There needs to be a, a recognition at the IMO uh, that that, that uh, you know action is needed, and, and everybody's on, on on board with that. Um, so I think that's the that's the the, the fundamental uh, point. Um, and, and everything else will 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 flow from will flow from that more people on board or or to pick up my point i made a minute ago technology being used to address uh yeah. the, the onboard working experience to make it more humane um before we you know before we even think about reducing uh, the, the people on board any any further so there are two two comments that i would make in response to that that question Thank you very much. Um, Raphael Baumler again, please. Yes, sorry. So, Professor Baumler, um, you and your colleagues have worked really hard for a long time on this report and, and you've you've set out for us what what the key takeaways are. I'd like to know what uh, how do you see um, a, a good work rest hours culture? I, I think the problem of rest hours culture is not the only problem. I would say the problem is reporting in general. It's beyond the reporting of rest hours. It, it, for me it's just a revelator of a major issue which is the lack of feedback and inappropriate feedback and for me the problem is very much how can we have and how can we create and generate a feedback which is relevant accurate and good and when the company can reply exactly to what is expected in order to improve safety this is what they developed you know in in the aviation sector in the aviation sector they developed the concept of just culture it's probably something that we should think about in the in the maritime now um seafarers at sea uh, have access to social media uh, and and you know they are they are linked to the shore in the way that they probably never been linked to the shore in 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 the past um and you talk about the the lack of feedback or, or um the difficulty in expressing their views through feedback do you think social media is a good way forward i think any kind of media is a good way forward but, but here again, we have already uh, in place, we have the complaint procedures which have been uh, created by the MLC 2006. So there is already some mechanisms. The problem is why the seafarers are not using them. Are, are they afraid to complain? Are they afraid to report the, the, their issues? Even, even when it's anonymous or it can guarantee a certain level of confidentiality as expected by the MLC 2006, why, why it's not happening so regularly? I think it was addressed more in the idea. It's, it's accepted for, for a lot of them. It's accepted. The work must be tough. It's accepted. Even if it doesn't provide good and decent working condition, even if it affects health and safety of the workers, but also safety of the vessel, and which is something very worry that the community in general should take care of because it's, it's, uh, it has an impact, a direct impact on the safety of the vessel. Thank you very much. Um, Cleopatra Dumbia Henry. Okay. 
Are you there, Cleo? Yes, I didn't realize. Yeah, I was there. I was waiting for you to hear what you were saying. Yes. <laughs> No, no, no problem at all. It's it's a, a little bit of a slow system at the moment. Um, one of the, one of the things that is coming across is that we can't just say to the seafarers, "This is your problem. Go and deal with it." Um, we even can't even say to the port state control uh, officers, "This is your problem. You're not doing your job properly." There seems to be a little bit in this for everybody. Uh, is that how you see this? I I do I think I think that the nature the way in which um, you know you know we have flag states and you know and 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 you know the, the, my problem is the corporate veil the corporate veil there's a problem with the corporate veil because uh, today's um, ships are flagged uh, are owned in by somebody else in one particular country and. And however, the ships are registered somewhere else. And most of the countries where the ships are registered is the in the developing world. They have very little capacity apart from countries, uh, I wouldn't call it developing anymore, Panama, or they'd have very strong capacity. And if they really wanted to do a good job, and I think they've been trying very hard to do a good job. Um, but, you know, when you see that, when you see, I also think you can't just leave it to the, sh to the seafarers on board, but also uh, the flag state. What is the responsibility of the flag state to make sure that, um, you know, whether or not it, whether or not it, you know, that ship is probably, you um, uh, contracted to some somewhere else, but at least it still is the flag state's uh, responsibility. I think that much more should be much more emphasis. Uh, the flag state should be much more rigorous in ensuring that um, the requirements of the MLC are met. They are the ones under the MLC or the IMO convention with that responsibility. So I do think flag states have to do more to ensure that ships, whether they charter them or whatever they do, that these ships are meeting the requirements and enabling seafarers in terms of hours of work and hours of rest to ensure that they do. This is the minimum for safety. It's all about safety at sea, not only of the vessel but say, and the environment, but also primarily the safety of seafarers. So something there, in my view, has to click. And the other thing I would also say, it's not, and that's probably a party, when we, it's something we can deal with at another time, because it's the same problematic, which is, again, the, um, all of the issues relating to wages and, again, double bookkeeping. So these are the problems, and they are problems that are difficult to solve, uh, but I do think uh, that more awareness needs to be raised vis-a-vis uh, -vis flag states uh, to do more about these issues. Okay, well, I'll come to Julie to, to talk about the flag states in a moment. Um, can I ask you about uh, Mark's point about technology? Um, you are obviously really close to uh, the IMO discussions about autonomous shipping and digitalization in its, in its, in its various forms. Do you think this, uh, this new technology is going to help in this situation, or is it really a human element issue that must be tackled from the human perspective? Um, well, WMU issued, uh, it's already almost uh, soon, two years now, a re major report on the on technology um, and the impact on, uh, you know, the innovation and technology and, and, and its broader impact. And that, that particular report, which has been very, very well received, uh, looks as well at the um, working conditions and it, it, it does uh, highlight very much in terms of the impact technology is now having on, you know, the construction design of ships and, and uh, that it is now today extremely important that this bigger issue of, you know, the future is that of technology as technology is moving to uh, completely change the working landscape that we all, in, and particularly for seafarers. I have to turn that off.
um, that, um, that, that again, that is a major report that has brought to light a significant number of deficiencies and issues that must be addressed and be taken forward. The future of work, it is called. The future of work and the impact of technology on the future of work is something that now has to be integrated more broadly when we look at the revision of any new instruments or, or existing instruments to bring them up to date with what is happening in terms of technology and its impact, of course, on CFRs. So, uh, if you, if you go back to the the future of work um, report, just just run this al along the uh, the seafarer exhaustion problem that we're addressing today. How will technology help us um, to tackle seafarer exhaustion? Well, one of the you know, of course, as technology um, impacts like it, it does impact everywhere, even our education system is impacted by technology today. Um, so that that's the future. We cannot be one of the things that we have to recognize is that mm -hmm. this is this is where this is the future of work. Um, and we have to find when and that's where I think we now have to be uh, the education model, the, the sort of training of seafarers now need to take into account preparing them for the for the you know those that are coming up of course for what the new vessel is going to be looking like and what are the working conditions and and that will have a huge impact not just for the seafarers but a huge impact and something that will be extremely important for the relevant international organizations both the IMO and the ILO to take these into account in terms of what the future of work at sea will look like in the next 10 years for seafarers as technology and innovation be, continues to drive the and, and, and put, drive the the future of of shipping particularly the education model for the seafarers that we want to attract today probably younger seafarers will or the or future seafarers will be very excited about using and working with technology but we have to begin to look at our educational model and the curriculum that the future of work would need for the future seafarers uh, and it's already happening and we see you know what you call autonomous shipping happening uh in, in, a, in of course at a small at a, at a very slow pace right now and COVID 19 may have stopped a lot of things but i think we have to begin to look at our educational system right now for seafarers to make sure that we can and hopefully attract uh, young people who would be excited about uh working at sea and life at sea. But for that to happen too, we have to, and the technology will come in that has to ensure that it becomes an attractive profession for the future. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, we will lose, uh, we'll lose the human capacity, but the world depends on, and we saw that in the pandemic, the world depends on shipping. Without, without shipping today, that pandemic, without ships that have really kept us all alive, Shipping is important, and that is where my connection between the pandemic and the impact it has had on seafarers is such a very sad and serious matter. But the, the technology providers uh, are claiming that uh, in a very short period of time, uh, a lot of the routine work that seafarers currently have to do will be done automatically uh, through sensors and through data analytics. So maybe some of the, the, uh, the hours spent by seafarers won't be required in 10, 5, 10 years time. Well, I, I doubt that very much. I mean, I think it is, uh, it is, it's important to know. It's good to follow that this, uh, that the, that technology that will impact so much. Uh, and, and certainly it will attract uh, people from uh, no, new seafarers from developing countries uh, uh, who would probably much more be technologically exposed to the new ships. But when you think of where the ships have to go to get the cargo, the way is cargo coming from today? Where is cargo coming from? Whatever you have to wear shipping, they have to be coming from the places if technology is going to be driving it so much, that technology have to reach those places. Uh, for today, most of the, the goods that ships carry uh, are actually, um, uh, actually um, these goods are, are coming from 
uh, the developing world. So, uh, of course, there are high-tech things that are being built elsewhere, but I think uh, it will take a lot of time and a totally new curriculum that would have to be put in place and designed by academic institutions to enable the future seafarers uh, to be able to, um, you know, join the automated ships, that, uh, whether uh, ashore or on board. But I think that this will be a, a, a long way into the future. Of course, COVID-19 will have taught us a lot of, given us a lot of examples and experiences, and it, yeah. it may help move that a bit faster, but we will have to wait and see. Thank you. Uh, can I go back to Katie Higginbottom again, please? Hello, Katie. Um, I'd like to put the same question to you. Um, you are involved with seafarers, you know, day by day by day. Tell me about the new technology. Do they do they um, see this as as a way out of the whole culture of exhaustion? Do you, like Cleopatra, think it's going to be a long way off? Um, talk to me about the, the the linking between seafarers and new technology. Um, so I think seafarers are obviously a, a young generation now, so um, they're much more adept with new technology, social media, much more connected um, than than myself or, or, uh, or me. Other generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of what's going on on ships, um, I think it's um, not so much as in some other sectors. Like obviously, the ports are um, really changing into a, a, a very different environment um but uh I, I can't really see technology making a massive difference to seafarers in the in the in the context of fatigue if if we look at what's in the report about um the the, the digitized methods of reporting hours of work and hours of rest um what that means is that you know when there's non-compliance it's flagged up in red so it gets adjusted so I, I think I can't see anything um, in reality. I'm not that close to it. I'm, you know, sitting in my office um, trying to support Zephyr's welfare, and and I would hesitate to to call myself an expert in this field. But I don't see anything currently that is going to mitigate um, the issues that Zephyr's have to deal with for fatigue. And I, if I can. Um, continue for a moment on on the subject around fatigue and the link with um, mental health and well-being. Currently, there is a great interest in mental health and well-being and people are really aware of it. People are, are you know, um, rushing to embrace the, uh, the, the recognition and the, the need to, to be sensitive to, to mental as well as physical health. And there are, there's so much um, evidence of um, connection with fatigue um, and, and mental health. Can we can we um, can we address this differently through a concern about that? It's it, clearly it's true that PNI clubs and insurance have an important potential part to play because of their interest in in the in the potential costs of accidents and casualties. Um, but if we're thinking about the seafarers, if we're genuinely caring about the well-being of seafarers. We have to we have to open up to this issue, and and fundamentally, as Mark said at the beginning, it's all about Manning. It's all about the fact that really the buck stops with the flag states, and if we can't break this issue of competition over Manning numbers, then then you know we we might as well go home. But I, and I think there's no that there's nothing wrong with reiterating and. Um, restating the problems because just because it hasn't we haven't managed to open a door as yet we still have to keep presenting the reality to people and say really really are you still happy about this going on now that you've got this information now that this this is really clear that on the one hand you're saying um, you're terribly concerned about seafarers mental health and well-being but on the other hand it's somehow impossible to address this issue that's been apparent for decades. Certainly Mark has said and one or two of your colleagues have said that that coronavirus 
has elevated seafarers' mental health issues to a position where we weren't in 2019. So, you know, Mark used the idea of a, a, a silver lining and I get exactly what he means. Do you think we will look at seafarer mental health differently this year or next year, whenever we emerge from coronavirus, than we were two years ago? Um, well, I th the thing that um, slightly cheers me up about the situation is that it was, it's interesting to read, I think in your newspaper, um, companies like Fidelity saying, oh, um, seafarers, um, supply chains, this is serious. The whole ESG agenda. Um, I think if we can open out shipping um, away from its, you know, as Cleo mentioned, corporate veils, um, its, its um, preference for staying in the shadows and being, um, you know, lightly regulated. Um, if this whole issue and this whole agenda can reach a, a broader audience of um, influential stakeholders like um, the financial institutions, um, I don't know about the charters, that's a whole different picture. But um, if we can get beyond maritime with this issue, then maybe that can bring back some pressure to bear onto the regulators and the flag states. Thank you very much. Um, Julie Carlton, please. Hello, Julie. Um, a few, uh, we've had a few uh, comments here about flag states and how they should be more rigorous in uh, implementing um, the regulations, which are already in place. Do you, are you under pressure to, to do this? Uh, and somebody else was, was, was mentioning about how one flag state competes with a different flag state on uh, manning um, levels. Are you under pressure to uh to to match everyone else well, of course the pressure is there yes but i mean i think that the uk we we like to think that we do follow the guidelines and we we take this very seriously within the uk um i mean safe safe manning um doc documents are you know the the proposals come from the ship owners they're screwed they're scrutinized very carefully and we follow them up we don't just um sign it off and leave it you know it is followed up, um, you know, through ISM audits and and if and um, you know, with checking records and so on at a later stage when, because a flag state has a bit more time for record keep record checking than than the port state inspectors do. Um, so, but uh, yes, I mean, recognise the pressures, obviously, um, and it's not it's not easy. Um, but it but it's, it's it's something we're very we're very keen on. You need to sit on top of it, yeah. Hmm. Um, um, Katie was saying just now about um, ESG, so um, environmental, social and, and, and governance, and, and I think this falls very much within the S. Um, it's, it's one of my personal concerns that we're all talking about the E, the environmental side of this, and very little about the, the, the S. Do you, uh, in, your, in your thinking about ESG, um, do you think the social side, the mental health side, the seafarer hours and regulation side of ESG will grow uh, uh, as the year moves on? Well, let's hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, I think as people have said, it has it has moved up the agenda considerably in the last year. Um, and uh, but I think even before that, actually, there'd been quite a lot of um, discussions, a lot of seminars and so on about seafarer well-being. Um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people producing guidance. The, the MCA has produced some books in the last couple of years on on seafarer guidance. And through the crisis, we've seen things like the Neptune Declaration of companies coming together and um, recognising the, the, the so, their social responsibilities. As it's happening across other industries, you know, responsible fishing and um, those sorts of things. So, yes, let's, I think it is. We're making progress slowly. <laughs> Let's hope that S is 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 more emphasized. Um, I, I, I agree. Uh, Mark Dickinson, please. Hi, Richard. 
Mark, get us out of this hole. What 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 should we need? What should we do this year, twenty twenty one, to tackle the issue of of exhaustion? Let's. I, I appreciate we've been talking about this for years, for decades, but all of a sudden, this is in front of us. You've now got ten months to solve this. What are the first steps you would take? Oh, you give me the difficult questions, don't you? Well, what did I do to upset you in a preview? Did I not buy lunch or something? Look, That's I mean, a question mark. <laughs> I, 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 I give my time to think. I, I think, um, I mean, one of the points I wanted to make, and I think I can, I can, uh, with a, with a clear conscience, uh, deploy this now in in response to that question because I'm the I'm a union guy. I lead the Nautilus, so I, I I can't speak for Port State. I can't speak for Flag State. I know what they should be doing. It's all been set out in the report. Reports got a lot of recommendations directed at Port State, Flag States, in, international institutions, ship owners, and it's got some for seafarers as well. So what I can do over the next two months is that I can play my part uh, uh, in the trade union movement to educate and provide tools uh, and trying to empower the seafarers to speak up. And I'm, I'm not that's not me shifting the blame onto the, my members. That's me saying we do we do have to challenge you know, that, that resilience and that acceptance of this situation. We have to speak up and we have to support our members to, and give them the tools to, to say enough is enough, yeah? Time for change, guys. You know, we have, to, we, we have to record our hours properly. We need to give them the tools so they don't have a software system provided by a commercial enterprise or by their company that is gained... For success, I think, is uh, some terminology that was, uh, I may have mangled from Raphael's report. But, uh, you know, some comments here in the chat. You know, you put in your hours and it comes up red and says no. And you're almost in invited to try again, you know, because you got that wrong. You know, can't quite. Those hours can't be correct because you're coming up red. We need you to come up green. Now, you know, maybe the ILO needs to produce some software. Maybe the MCA or the flag states need to produce some software. Nautilus, we've produced some software in the past, and I'm going to have to take a look at that again because I think you know maybe we maybe we need to push it out again and update it. Um, you know, th this there needs to be uh, somebody with no skin in the game behind some some technology, Richard, some tools, some software that Cyprus can say, hey, the ILO software says my hours of rest are not good enough, or my hours of work are too long. We need to sort something out, not the companies. That, that that's been gained for success. So, you know, empowerment, education, um, reporting, using the complaints procedures, ISM code in the MLC 2006. It's all set out in the report. And you know, we've got people from Chirp here on the on on the webinar. You know, if 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 you don't feel that you can use either of those formal processes, then at least let's use the confidential reporting programs that are there chair um certainly uh, chief among them uh, that that's that's what we we've got to do we, we've got to speak up we've got to speak up and we've got to be there to support seafarers who do that and you were talking about technology earlier one of the the questions on the chat book talks about um smart watches in other words using technology which most of us are wearing uh, every day when we go for a run to try to uh, record um, seafarers hours far more accurately than they are currently being done. Do you think this is a way forward? It, it, I wouldn't rule it out. I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm open to, I, I've got one myself, you know, I, I, I'm, there you go. At the moment, it's just telling me that I'm very inactive uh, because I can't obviously go out as much as I would like to go out. Um, and, and, you know, they, they've used um, similar um, uh, techniques in the uh, Project Horizon and other studies, um, the names of which escape me at this particular moment. But they have they do they have measured uh, uh, activity and uh, and uh, to great effect. So I think uh, yeah, I, why not? You know why not? I, we should be open to that kind of thing. Um, you know, obviously down there, there are issues of uh, health data, uh, and confidentiality, that kind of thing. I'm sure those could, things could be worked through because in principle. If it's yep. good for the seafarer, empowers them, um, and provides real live data, then why not? Yeah. So your your um, certainly short term solution is speak up, challenge the culture. 
Yeah, yeah, and we've got to be there to support CFRS because this, the p report from from the WMU, of course, does highlight that many CFRS are working in quite precarious uh, relationships with employees, you know, on short-term okay. contracts, voice-based contracts. So we we've got to recognise that that difficulty. But I did I did also emphasise, you know, port states, flag states, um, they need to be there as well. Yeah, but you say you, you're a union man and you can only talk from the union perspective. So so thank you very much for that. Um, um, Raphael Baumler, if I can come back to you, please. Uh, Raphael, you made some recommendations at the at the end of your uh, report, and I'd just like to uh, to bring these to a close as as we're coming to the the close of the webinar. What are your key recommendations, and who are they aimed at? Cool. I think you've seen the list. There's quite a lot of them. Yeah, um, but but choose the key ones, please. Okay, I, I think the key ones would be for now because we are talking about today. Uh, yep. would be very much the enforcement regime, would be very much the flag state, how they can tackle the issue, how when they have the annual survey this year or maybe next year, the flag state really take action on the verification of the accuracy of records. I think that would be a very short term uh, action. Another short term action would be also launching national or MOUs campaign on the same topic of fatigue, but still here with more emphasis on the verification of the accuracy of records. I think when we will have this, it will, it will be a good signal to the seafarers and also to the ship owners saying, look, there's a problem. This is a number of issues we've seen when we made the cross check. So that would be very much my recommendation, very short term. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Cleopatra Dumbia Henry, please. Cleo, are you there? Maybe we've lost Cleo. Um, Katie Higginbottom, can I can I go to you then, please? Thank you. Um, so the same really question, really, to you, Katie. Um, what? What key? What 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 is the key aspect of getting us out of this hole, in your view? Um, I think it's I think it's to maintain the conversation and and bring together some coalitions of the willing. So uh, my intention is to is to work with Raphael to look at the recommendations and try and pull together some strategies. I think we we've been a bit kind of bowled over by um by the change in our world with covid and by suddenly being out of face to face meetings and into the world of zoom and other more exotic platforms mm. and um, I think you know okay we, so but in the so I think that maybe held us back from following up for for a while, but now I think um, you know we're we're in this different reality, and it does have certain advantages in the sense that you can cheaply get um, half of the world or from different sides of of the planet all together to talk about things. And I think um, we need to follow up on that. And I'm I'm kind of with Raphael that we uh, a logical starting point would be the port state control MOUs. I think you know we all appreciate that. Um, they have a they have a heavy duty to to carry with the enforcement um and we kind of go to them because it's easier than than finding a chink in the armor of the flag state sometimes um but i think if we if we go there um with some solutions for example in the in the report there's um there's a, a a kind of checklist that's that's sort of pre-provided that and um, that kind of sets out indicators of of non-compliance. So if we could get a, a agreement around pursuing a, a common approach, um, then I think that would be the way forward. I think you know there are there are so many layers to this and so many players that I think we're looking for for what might work and if there is any low hanging fruit. Um, and hard to see with this issue, but that would that would be my approach. 
So maintaining the conversation um, is, is, is quite close to what, uh, what Mark is saying, that uh, we ought to try and get the seafarers to speak up, don't be afraid to say if, if these things are not working. Um, last word, if, if I could, to Julie Carlton, uh, please. Oh, Cleopatra's there. Okay, let's go to Cleo. Cleo, are you there? Yes, I, I, I was just unable. I was, just, um, I was there all the time. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing Katie, but I couldn't, I couldn't figure out the button. <laughs> my my staff went, so I couldn't figure out the button. Right, sorry. No problem at all. Um, what I was asking was, what uh, what is the key to tackling exhaustion of seafarers? And we've had quite a, some interesting examples here of of speaking up, speaking out, talking together. Um, but flag state seems to be, uh, you know, on on the on the hook here. What's your key? How do we get out of exhaustion? Yeah, I mean, my view is really um, a lot, probably a lot more pressure needs to be put on flag states to ensure that this hours of work and hours of rest and it's uh, hours of work and hours of rest are respected. And that should be done both by the IMO and the ILO together. I, I do think um, uh, because ILO hours of work IMO hours of rest. These two have been integrated into the MLC, but unless unless much more pressure is put onto the in to the sort of the flag states themselves to ensure that the the ships that are under their flag actually respect the um, uh, respect the instruments concerned. I, either I, hours of work or hours of rest. That choice exists, but uh, I think it is the lack uh, and and port state control, of course, can do a lot in um, in trying to uh, you know raise awareness of this or, or, or certainly um, uh, you know hold some ships up in in in, in port. But many of the seafarers are themselves part of that. Uh, for you know, falsification of the records because they are afraid. It is fair. How do we help seafarers overcome that fear? And since they have short-term contracts, that's the next problem. And there are so many seafarers around the world from from the countries from which they can be recruited. Seafarers are afraid to lose their jobs. So it is a sort of a cycle, a cycle of um of issues that they as seafarers alone cannot address. And it is not just something alone that applies to hours of work and hours of rest. And my last point would say it applies as well to the problem of wages and the uh, and seafarers' wages and in, in a way the, 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 the double, you know, two, two contracts, two different documents. And that is so it's a, it's a broader problem. But I think um, flag states have to do more to ensure and to enable respect for the instruments, not just in law, because many of them have the legislation, but in practice, implement it in practice. Thank you, that's very clear. Um, I'd like to give the last word, if I may, to Julie Carlton at the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. There you are. Same question to you, Julie. Um, You've heard what the others have said. Do you agree? Would you like to add to those? I agree with most. Yes, with with what everybody said. I mean, it, there's. I think it's um, this needs to be tackled from all angles. Um, and what I would say from our point of view is that we will review the report against the guidance we've got for our surveyors, mm -hmm. um, both as port, port port state and flag state, because there's some quite useful um, insights in there as to what causes. Um, the, the um, adjustment of records. So I think we can pick up on some of those points and, and point our surveyors you know, to, to look out for those things. Um, and and then on the other side, to promote safety culture um, in the companies that we, we work with through the flag. Um, because you were asking earlier about how you promoted, you know, what's a good hours of work culture? Well, it's part of a safety culture, of a wider safety culture. And it's not just about complying with the minimum hours of rest it's that that's a minimum not the norm and you should be looking at the wider picture um, to, to ensure safety so that would be my two uh, takeaway things very good thank you very much um, 
can I thank all of my uh, my panel? It's been a fascinating discussion. I think it's a discussion that went beyond uh, the uh, a culture of adjustment um, report that the World Maritime University put out. It's a culture of adjustment of an industry, uh, and we can't identify the seafarers as the problem, or even the flag state as the problem. But that's um, they've they've come up for a little bit of of criticism, and and rightly so. In my view, uh, the, the whole seafarer issue is very much part of the uh, ESG uh, with the S needing to be underlined m much, much harder than it, than it has been. There, there is uh, too much of an emphasis per perhaps on the environmental side and then less so, but, but importantly on the governance side. And the seafarers issue really has to be tackled as a part of this safety culture. So thank you for listening. Uh, I think my my role uh, ends here. I don't know if uh, is it Katie going to say a, a final goodbye to us? Is that is that your role, Katie? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I'd like to say thank you to you. Um, it's very kind of you to host this <laughs> this webinar. Um, thank you very much. I think it was. Um, really insightful um it's very interesting to see the the chat coming through as well lots of interesting ideas and conversations going on there um many of which i agree with um i'd like to sort of shout out to a few people there actually thanks to um the itf inspectors that participated in this report um and i see some of the wmu students that um that we've sponsored from the itfc for us trust as well so it's nice to see some names there so um, just to draw this to an end, thank you, um, Mark and the team at Nautilus. Thank you, Lloyd's List. Thanks to the panel, um, Julie, Raphael, Cleo. Um, it's been fascinating and um, be under no doubt that we will continue with this area of work and we will continue to engage with you and um, we won't let this issue um, stay quiet any longer. So thank you very much, um, all participants, um, and um, I close it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Just me and you left, I think. <laughs> Everyone else is gone.